So on January 5, 2001, I was introduced face to face with Campus Outreach for the first time. I stood in front of 4,000 students in Atlanta at the Campus Outreach National Christmas Conference. And from that meeting on and that lunch gathering that we had there on, it was in my heart to bring Campus Outreach to Minneapolis. And God was so good to us. I have said publicly more than once, and I'll say it again now, that it may be that the most important part of my legacy for 33 years at Bethlehem Baptist Church will be that that happened. One of the reasons that I was so eager to see Campus Outreach come to Minneapolis and to Bethlehem was because I felt from the beginning in all the connections that I had that the vision of this ministry was so closely tied to the heartbeat of my life. My life mission statement is, I exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. And so the fact that you exist to glorify God by building laborers on the campus for a lost world is sweetly in harmony with that. And so it's a huge honor to talk about this theme with you in these three sessions that I have on the glory of God. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to go to Exodus, and if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to Open it to Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to look at how God revealed Himself as a God who is, and a God who is personal, and a God who is glorious, and a God who is passionate about revealing His personal, glorious name. That's kind of the outline of where we're going in, in the Exodus. The title for this first message that I was assigned and was happy to receive, Glorifying God, period. Glorifying God, the glory of God, as the ultimate, absolute, all-pervasive reason for being everything that we are and doing everything that we do. Let me start with the definition before we go to the text. What I mean by glorifying God is feeling and thinking and doing what we do, acting in a way that reflects the greatness of God, in a way that makes much of God, thinking feeling, doing things in a way that gives evidence of His supreme greatness in all of His attributes and His all-satisfying beauty when all the attributes are seen together. So am I feeling right now feelings that give evidence that God is great? In grace, great in power, great in wisdom. Is that what my feelings are saying? That's what it means to glorify God. Am I thinking a thought right now? Is the thought that I'm thinking an evidence of His greatness in grace and in power and wisdom and justice and truth? Is the deed that I'm doing at this moment, an evidence that God is great in grace toward me, in power over all my adversaries, in wisdom to solve every problem I have. Is that what my action is saying? That's what I mean by glorifying God. 
making much of him in my feelings and my thinking and my doing. So here's the main point of today's message. The reason you should glorify God that way in everything that you do and think and feel is because God does everything for His glory. And that's what we're going to see in the book of Exodus. So He's going to reveal Himself as the God who is. He's going to reveal Himself with a personal name. He's going to reveal himself as glorious, and he's going to reveal himself as having a passion that the glory of that name be known on your campuses. That's the outline. He is, he's personal with a name, he's glorious, and he's passionate that that be known. Those are my four steps. So let's go to the text. It's been read. I want to read it again. Exodus 3, 12 to 15. Situation, you know, is that God has come to Moses in the wilderness and told him he's going to be the deliverer and go down there and tell them so. He said, God said, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people of Egypt, when you have have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Verse 13. And then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to this people, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So they ask, what's his name? And God says three things. The first thing is not his name. The second thing is not his name. And the third thing is his name. Let's look at the three things that he says. Verse 14, first part of the verse. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's not his name. It's as though... He's saying, before I tell you my name, before I show you how glorious it is, before you talk about how you're going to glorify me in this conference, you just need to settle in on I am. God is, absolutely is. That's the first thing. Then he says, second half of verse 14, and he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's not his name. That's building a bridge between his being, I am who I am, and the name which is coming in verse 15. Now, third thing he says, his name. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh. All caps, L-O-R-D, in your English Bible, always translating, probably translated, it being probably pronounced, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, this is my name, Yahweh, forever. It's almost always translated L-O-R-D. Sometimes capital G, capital O, capital D, if it's occurring together with other words. It's a personal name, Yahweh. It's not a title. That's one of the problems with translating it L-O-R-D. We hear L-O-R-D as a title. Every time you hear Lord, all caps, 
think this is his personal name. I love to think about this. It's, it's a name like James or Mary. <clears throat> it's not like Lord or God. It's like John, Elizabeth. It's his name. And you know, I presume, that Yahweh is <clears throat> sometimes shortened to Yah, and it's put on the end of the word hallelujah, Yah. So I love every time we sing the word hallelujah, Yah. I, I, I do that in my head, even if the music isn't doing it. I do that in my head. Hallelujah, James! And you know that hallelujah is the imperative Hebrew praise Praise James, we praise you, Yahweh. It's personal, it's a name. And it's a name above every name. So you're saying, Yah, not Bel, Yah, not Nebo, Yah, not Malach, Yah, not Mammon, Yah. I think God loves to be named. And I think powers fall when he is sung that way. So know that he's giving them a name and then he uses it 5,321 times in the Old Testament. Why? That's amazing. In a few minutes, in a few minutes, we're going to see how jealous he is for that name to be known. But first, we need to just pause and reflect on the connection between the name and the "I am who I am." So the first thing he says, "I am who I am." Then he says, "I am has sent me to you." Then he says, "Yahweh is my name." Now, I assume you've all heard this, but Yahweh is built on the Hebrew verb for be, or I am. So this is not not disconnected like this name has nothing to do with I am who I am. Every time you hear Yah, hallelujah, praise you, Yah, you hear hallelujah, the personal one who absolutely is, and there is no other. He means for his own personal name to always be carrying the freight of I am. And so we should pause here before we even contemplate why it's a name, why he gave himself a personal name, and and contemplate that he is. Underneath everything that's going to be said in this conference, everything that's going to be done in your life or here, is that God is. What does it mean that God is? The fact that God is, is breathtaking. Let me try to help you to see some of the tip of the iceberg that He is. That God is means He never had a beginning. This staggers every mind, especially four-year-old minds. Who made God, Daddy? Nobody made God. What happens in a little head when you say that? Wonderful things happen. Wonderful things happen. They're confronted with absoluteness. No beginning. Take a lifetime. Take an eternity, little one. He was. He is. He will be. No beginning. Second, that God is means He'll never end. His being will never go away. You can't go out of being if you are being. There's no place to go outside being. There wasn't anything else. Third, God is means He's absolute reality. Nothing before Him. No reality outside of Him before He makes it. 
He's not one of many realities. He's simply there, absolute reality. He was eternally. There, there was no space into which he fit. Before creation, there was no emptiness. There was God. That's all there was. There was no space. No nothingness. There was God. That's all there was, was God. That's what it means to be God and then make God. Space, make emptiness. Fourth, God is means that God is utterly independent, doesn't depend on anything outside himself, brings everything into being. That's what the linguistic construction, I am who I am. Nobody makes me that way. I just am that way. That's what that I am, who I am means. You can hear it. It's supposed to have that effect on your head when you say it. Nothing outside of me made me what I am. I'm absolute. Five, God is means that everything that God, that is not God, was made by God, depends totally on God. God is secondary to God. I love to think that the universe is secondary. People get all excited about the world, planets, the galaxies, the universe. It's secondary. <coughs> it's like a peanut that he carries in his pocket. Less. Six, God is God is means all the universe by comparison is nothing. Contingent, dependent reality is to absolute independent reality as a shadow to a substance, as an echo to a thunder clap, as a bubble to an ocean. Listen to Isaiah 40, 17. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Seven, God is means God is constant. Same yesterday, today, forever. He cannot be improved. He's not becoming anything. There's no development in God. There's no progress in God. You can't improve on absolute perfection. Eight, God is means that he is the absolute standard of goodness and truth and beauty. There's no law book that he consults about what is right. There's no almanac he checks for facts. There's no guild where he goes to see if he or anything he does is excellent. He is the definition of excellence. He is the definition of right, true, beauty, goodness. He defines it by his being. Nine, God is means that God does whatever he pleases. And it's always right, beautiful, in accord with truth. There are no constraints on him from outside, making him do anything he doesn't want to do. Therefore, he's the freest of all beings. And finally, number 10, God is means that he is the most important, most valuable reality in the universe and the most important and the most valuable person in the universe. Therefore, he's more worthy of our interest, more worthy of our attention and our admiration and our enjoyment than any other reality in this world or outside this world. That's a little bit of what it means for God to be. God is. Never get over that God is. Be stunned with your students that God is. Look at them and say, isn't it amazing? He is. He is who he is. That's the first thing he reveals here in this text. 
That's your job. Glorify this God. Your students were made to know Him. They were made to admire Him, enjoy Him. Their hearts ache for this God, and they don't know it. And that's why they do what they do. And your job is impossible. You all know that. You're all Presbyterians with a sprinkling of Baptists, right? So (laughs) you know this truth. This is impossible. God sends the Apostle Paul to open the eyes of the blind, it says in Acts 26, 18. He can't do that. Oh. Isn't it great to be signed up for the impossible? All over the world, this is your job to show them who they're aching for. Now the question, that's number one, God is, He shows that He is, now He's personal. What about this name? Why a name? Translated L-O-R-D, but it's a personal name. Verse 15, God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This, this Yahweh, is my name forever. Thus, I am to be remembered throughout all generations. God was not content to be known as a conglomeration of divine attributes. Not the powerful one, the loving one, the wise one. He's not content with that. I want to have a name. Why? Because people who are persons relate with names. If you all just went around calling each other by titles, there wouldn't be much relationship here. Names make relationships. And we move in and out of kinds of relationships by kinds of names. Nicknames and sweet names and precious names. And names are huge in relationship. God did not intend to be known as, a, as an assortment of attributes merely. But as Yahweh, James, Elizabeth, just a name. He has a name. And if you ask, so if we're to know him personally by the name Yahweh, how does that relate to the name Jesus? Don't we know him now as Jesus? You know, I presume, that Yesu in Greek is the Greek form of the word Yeshua, which is Joshua which is made up of two words, right? Yahshua. Yahweh saves. That's Joshua's name. Yahshua. So you will call his name Yahshua for he, Yahweh, will save. His people from their sins. In other words, you don't have to choose between Jesus and Yahweh. You dare not choose. It's even more amazing when you consider what Paul does in Philippians 2. Philippians 2.11, every tongue will confess that Yeshua Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a quote from Isaiah 43, 25, where Yahweh is the one to whom every knee will bow. And every exegete that doesn't have a conceptual bias against the deity of Christ sees what Paul is doing here. Namely saying, the name Jesus is fulfilling the name Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. 
So if you wonder about knowing him personally and you've come to know the name Jesus, the sweetest name on earth, that's okay. Just know it. Know it all. Know what you're saying when you say the name Jesus. Yeshua. Yahweh saves. That's my Jesus. That's number two. The name. So first, God is. Second, He is personal and has given us a name to be known by. And now third, He is, this name is glorious. Turn with me to Exodus 14. Moses has been sent with this name to lead the people out. How will God do this? What will his purposes be now that he has revealed himself as personal, the one who absolutely is? How will he lead them out? And as you know, we're going to see this is typical, prototypical of the Exodus Jesus would achieve for us. He leads us out of the bondage of sin. In his new exodus. But let's, let's look to see how God does it. What's making him tick now in chapter 14? Um, verse 2. Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi-Hahiroth. Really, this is crazy. If you've studied this, you know how how crazy this is. They were on the brink of deliverance, and God says, turn them back. Go backward. Why? We're almost free. Pharaoh and the biggest, strongest army in the world is behind us. We're almost free. You're going to tell us to go back. Yes. Why? Because then they'll come after you. They'll think you're trapped. I thought this was about deliverance. It is, but not mainly. It's not mainly about your deliverance. It's about my glory. And I I have a plan. And I mean to get glory in this deliverance. You're not just going to slip away. So let's go to verses 3 and 4. For Pharaoh, this is the reason why you're turning back. Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, Say of the people of Israel, they're wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians will know, I'm Yahweh, the glorious God who is. That's what I'm about here. Yeah, you're going to get delivered. It always works that way for people who trust me. Always works that way for people who trust me. I get glory, they get deliverance. So, they're trapped at the Red Sea. Now go to verses 16 to 18. Chapter 14, verses 16 to 18. Moses, lift up your staff. Stretch it out, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry land, on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know I'm Yahweh when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. So now put the pieces together here. Verse 4, I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. Verse 17, I will get glory over Pharaoh. Verse 18, the Egyptians will know I'm Yahweh when I get glory over Pharaoh and his chariots. So what's the point? 
It's two points. These are my last two points. The first one is Yahweh is glorious. The name Yahweh carries glory. When God is known as Yahweh in the world, when he uses that name 5,000, what did I say, 321 times, he means glorious Yahweh, always glorious Yahweh. There is no non-glorious evidence of Yahweh. Yahweh is never manifest in a non-glorious way. Everything He does, says, thinks, feels is glorious. The Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh when I've gotten glory over Pharaoh. So He means to be great in glory as he reveals himself as Yahweh. Yahweh is glorious. So now he reveals himself as the God who is. He reveals himself as personal with a name. He reveals himself now as glorious. I'm going to always get glory by this name. And Now lastly, he means to be known. This is where it gets really personal for you on your campus. He means for His being and His personalness and His glory to be known. Now, if, this is, if it was clear that His purpose is to be, and if it was clear that He aims to be personal, and if it's clear that He aims to be glorious, it is doubly clear in Exodus that He means for this to be known. So let me just... This is too fast for you to look them up. I'm just going to bullet text from Exodus so you feel this. Exodus 6, 7. You shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who's brought you out from under the burden. Chapter 7, verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand against Egypt. Chapter 7, verse 17. By this you will know that I am Yahweh. I will strike the water of the Nile and turn it to blood. Chapter 8, verse 10. You shall, that, that you may know that there is no God besides Yahweh. Chapter 8, verse 22. The swarms of flies shall fill, be, in, be in Goshen shall not be in Goshen, that you may know that I am Yahweh in the midst of the earth. Chapter 9, verse 16, For this purpose, Pharaoh, I raised you up to show you my power, that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Exodus 9, 29, <clears throat> There will be no more hail, so that you may know that there is a God, Yahweh, in the earth. Chapter 10, verse 2, Tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson what signs I have done among the Egyptians that you may know that I am Yahweh. Chapter 14, verse 4, I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. Verse 18 of chapter 14, the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh. I have devoted most of my adult life to a passion for God's supremacy in all things, spreading a passion for His supremacy. That's why (laughs) it's just all over the Bible. Usually when I preach on this, I I, I do what I just did with Exodus, I do it for the Bible. Like 30 of those instead of 10. You just go all over the Bible. What else would you spend your life doing? Besides praying and aching and crying and longing and preaching and staying up late with this student so that he would see it, love it, live for it all of his life. There's nothing more beautiful than to watch that happen at Campus Outreach in Minneapolis, to have a student come up to me, and I remember him as a freshman. What a jerk. (laughs) And now he's like a man. He's like a man. He's mature. He's got some sense of dignity. He's got a, a bearing about him because he's seen the king in glory. He's been surrounded by life-on-life men. Same thing that happens with women. It's the guys that tend to come to me, though. Nothing is more glorious. 
than to see the glory of God be seen and have a, a deepening, solidifying, strengthening, maturing effect on a human being who is such a silly jerk. And now he's whole, rich, strong, got something to give to this world. What a calling you have. To do it for one is worth a lifetime. Are you sad you've only had one? Don't be. He'll spend eternity thanking God for you. So, God is so passionate to be known. That's number, number four. This God of the Exodus has never ceased to be. I'll wrap it up now. He's never ceased to be. I'm going to... I want to walk you to Jesus here as we close. It's just amazing how this works. Um, The God of the Exodus is there in the Psalms, isn't he? Psalm 106. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, rebelled at the Red Sea, and God saved them for his name's sake. It's Psalm 106. Or he's there in the prophets. The God of the Exodus is there in the prophets. Isaiah 63, 11. Where is he who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make a name for himself, an everlasting name? It's there in Hosea 13. I am Yahweh, your God, from the land of Egypt. You know no other God but me. Besides me, there is no Savior. And you know that the God of the Exodus came into history in Jesus Christ. That's why they fled to Egypt. Matthew 2.15 This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I have called my son. He fulfills the new Israel. He fulfills the new Passover. He fulfills the new Deliverer. He fulfills the new Exodus. You remember the the Mount of Transfiguration and the conversation that he was having with Moses and Elijah. And it says, they appeared in glory and spoke of his Exodus, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And when he came to that night before the Exodus, it's like a Passover, he came to that night before the Exodus the next morning, where you would be delivered out of the bondage of sin and hell and death, and brought into the fellowship of sonship, what did he say was driving him that night? Here's what he said. This is John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled. What will I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. So, every one of you who has been delivered by the exodus of Calvary from the bondage of sin into a life of glorious ministry to students, know to what you owe your deliverance, Jesus' passion for the glory of God. I'm not leaving this hour. This is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That's why I'm here. You get the deliverance. He gets the glory. The reason, this is my main point, the reason you should do everything, this conference is called everything, The reason you should do everything to the glory of God is because God does everything for the glory of God. So campus outreach leaders, whether you eat or drink or whether you build laborers on the campus for for the glory of God and for the lost world, whatever you do in everything, do it for the glory of God.